kids to come forward for a little percussion. Um, so, you know, I actually need your help, kids, because wh one thing that I tend to do is I get excited when I play, and I tend to go faster and faster as I go through the song, which ends up confusing everybody. So I think if you guys can play the instruments and, like, really, really keep a good rhythm, then we can, we can, uh, we can make sure we don't do that. Okay, this is When Your Kingdom Comes. Here, we'll let the kids get ready here.
your church will sing. Take your bride away when your kingdom comes. Sorrow will be a race. Pain will wash away. We will see your face when your kingdom comes. We will. Okay, kiddos, if you just sit up here in the front seats, go ahead and be seated. You guys, thank you, worship team, this morning for leading us um, with that. And um, kiddos, this morning, (laughs) this morning, um, our very own Chris Heupel will be speaking about um, parables and the kingdom and when it comes. And he's going to be speaking about seeds and whatnot. So I need each kiddo to come grab a bag of seeds. Um, All right, come grab one. Uh, You too, Hazel. This is for you. There, take one. All right, do not open this bag till after church service. All right, but your job is to plant these seeds somewhere. And these are... The wonderful dandelion seeds. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Make sure to plant them in your parents' nice grass. Uh, It's just grass seeds. Um, There you go. And on this, there's a question. So show it, lean over to your parents and show them, or your guardians, and show them uh, what the question is. And it says, what is the kingdom of God like? What is the kingdom of God like? All right? What is the kingdom of God like? Right now, go ahead and just talk to the person next to you and just ask them that question. You don't need to answer it, but just say, hey, what is the kingdom? Go ahead and do it. And before... In... Um, <laughs> this is wonderful. In Matthew 11... All right, think of our little kiddos up here worshiping. This is what Jesus says. Listen to this, verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. 
All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal himself to. And then in verse 20 it says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11. Switch right over to Matthew 18. Check this out. And this is fresh with these kids being up here. Uh, but look at this. Who is the greatest? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You just said, you guys just were saying, when your kingdom come, we hear this word, what the kingdom come, what does that mean? But in chapter 18 of Matthew, verse 1, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What does Jesus say? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you become or turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. When we see little kiddos up here in that wonder and in that awe, being present to the moment of music or present to whatever they're doing now, in that thinking, in that learning, just moment by moment, to enter the kingdom through God's Spirit working in us, we have to become like little children. Those are Jesus' words, and it is so cool to just see our young ones up here. Um, but young ones, make sure to take your seeds home and plant them. Make sure to water them and do all the stuff that's required to grow your grass. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite our very own uh, Jeff. Come on up, if you would. Um, Jeff's one of our deacons here at the church. If you would just lead us in our, our call to worship this morning uh, through giving, that would be awesome. Check, 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 check. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. I'm Jeff. You're one of your deacons here at BCC. And um, today I have the three ways of giving. Um, first way is the offering boxes by the doors to the FLC. Well, not today, but we got them in the back here today in the back of the commons. You drop anytime you want. Go on to the My BCC app. And then you can also text GIVE to 701-214-6192. I'll pray for our offering. Lord, thank you for bringing us here today to worship you and your awesome beauty, and thank you for the wonderful day you've given us and the wonderful weather, and just have us be thankful for everything you give us with our, our talents and our money and our time, and just remember it's all for you, Lord, and help us to give back in any way we can. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. Yeah, I, I'm here to read scripture. I, I, I'm always so grateful for these gadgets, but more so uh, during this pandemic. I mean, I, I've used this gadget to grade, use it to Zoom. It's amazing. So uh, we're reading from Mark 26 uh, all the way to 34. Okay. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. 
Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts, on, puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke. there. <laughs> anyway, we, we thank God for this scripture and we thank God for Chris who's coming to preach uh, the word to us. Chris has been around for a while. He used to be our student ministries director way back then. When was that? 2014 to 2017. And he was telling me the last time he preached was in 2017. Uh, so we're excited to have Chris. I want to pray for Chris. Uh, you can come over. So I'm praying for Chris and for us that we might listen to God's word through him. Yeah. Lord, we thank you so much for Chris and uh, for the word of God that's going to come through him. Uh, we ask that you help us to pause a little bit and uh, to listen to you. Give us ears to hear and give us uh, even the ability to put whatever you ask us to do in practice. Uh, We've, uh, we've learned a lot already in this service. We've, uh, we've learned about your kingdom. And so we're praying that may your kingdom come in our lives and may we live according to your kingdom principles. We thank you and bless you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do we have that uh, first video? Praise be the nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care for lives saved and lives lost. Praise be the nurses and doctors, every medical staff bent over flesh to offer care, for lives saved and lives lost, for showing up either way. Praise for the farmers tilling soil, planting seeds so food can grow, an act of hope if ever there was. Praise be the janitors and garbage collectors, the grocery store clerks and the truck drivers barreling through long, quiet nights. Give thanks for bus drivers, delivery persons, postal workers, and all those keeping an eye on water, gas, and electricity. Blessings on our leaders making hard choices for the common good, offering words of assurance. Celebrate the scientists working a way to understand the thing that plagues us to find an antidote, and all the medicine makers. Praise be the journalists keeping us informed. 
Praise be the teachers, finding new ways to educate children from afar, and blessings on parents holding it together for them. Blessed are the elderly and those with weakened immune systems, all those who worry for their health. Praise for those who stay at home to protect them. Blessed are the domestic violence victims on lockdown with abusers, the homeless, and refugees. Praise for the artists and poets, the singers and storytellers, all those who nourish with words and sound and color. Blessed are the ministers and therapists of every kind, bringing words of comfort. Blessed are the ones whose jobs are lost, who have no savings, who feel fear of the unknown gnawing. Blessed are those in grief, especially who mourn alone. Blessed are those who have passed into the great night. Praise for police and firefighters, paramedics, and all who work to keep us safe. Praise for all the workers and caregivers of every kind. Praise for the sound of notifications, messages from friends reaching across the distance. Give thanks for laughter and kindness. Praise be our four-footed companions with no forethought or anxiety, responding only in love. Praise for the seas and rivers, forests and stones who teach us to endure. Give thanks for your ancestors, for the wars and plagues they endured and survived. Their resilience is in your bones and your blood. Blessed is the water that flows over our hands and the soap that helps keep them clean each time a baptism. Praise every moment of stillness and silence so new voices can be heard. Praise the chance and slowness. Praise be the birds who continue to sing the sky awake each day. Praise for the primrose poking yellow petals from dark earth. Blessed is the air clearing overhead so one day we can breathe deeply again. And when this has passed, may we say that love spread more quickly than any virus ever could. May we say this was not just an ending, but also a place to begin. I saw that video a couple weeks ago, and I don't know about you, but the first time I saw it, it just really spoke to me. We've lost a lot this year, but the good thing about the kingdom is whatever you lose is not more than what you gain. So when she took that um, sigh at the end there, I've been doing that a lot lately, just stopping and breathing and thinking about all the things that we could be thankful for. Um, Last night, we were on the way home from dinner with friends, and um, we were driving down through um, downtown Mandan. And, um, you know, Buggies and Blues is today, so they had all of the uh, area blocked off, and they had, um, you know, the stage set up for music and the tents up, and people were just out, and they were enjoying themselves. And today, people are down there enjoying themselves, and just nice, you know, have some normality. Um, what Tony just read in Mark chapter 4 uh, is an extension of the parable Jesus begins when he's teaching um, from the boat back in verses 1 through 20. So to kind of line them all up together, I'm going to start with 1, go to 20, and then we'll connect it through verses 26 through 34. So Mark chapter 4 it says, again he began to teach beside the sea and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat on it, sat in it on the sea and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land and he was teaching them many things and parables and in his teaching he said to them, listen, behold a sower went out to sow and as he sowed some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up <clears throat> since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. 
Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increased, increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 10, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where this word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And yet they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Verse 20, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. And they bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Mark chapter 4 is fantastic. I love it so much. Um, so, just going through the parable of the sower, it's a very sh- striking parable, and it's, I think, one of the easier parables to um, think about and memorize. I, it's one of the reasons why I picked it today. I was looking at the lectionary and um, from all the different scriptures. They had First Samuel and you know, some uh, scriptures in the Psalms and Proverbs. And I settled in on um, Mark chapter 4 because it seems to me Jesus is being very straightforward here. You know, if um, you're pretty familiar with the Bible, if you've, um, you know, been in books like Ezekiel or Revelation, sometimes you read something and you could read it for a hundred years and you still don't really have any idea. What, what, what are we trying to get to here? But I think Mark is... In Mark, Jesus is is cutting right to the chase. He's saying exactly what he means. But to explore the parable, we're going to do it a little bit differently today. We're going to be using some um, art to look at. I think we're just really visual creatures. You know, oftentimes on Sundays when um, Pastor Jared or Jim is preaching, how many of us start to, you know, look at the the paintings that we have up and and kind of get lost in them? So we're going to spend some time exploring Mark chapter 4 visually um, to see what some art can tell us about the parable that we might not already know or that maybe we don't think about a lot. But before we do that, uh, let's pray together. Mighty God, to you belong the mysteries of the universe. You transform shepherds into kings, the smallest seeds into magnificent trees, hardened hearts into loving ones. Jesus, bless us with your life-giving spirit. Fashion our lives to be like Christ's and shape us to your purposes. Through Jesus Christ, amen. All right, so does anyone know, oops, this fell out. Does anyone know when uh, summer officially begins? Zach, do you know? Hmm? Nope. Any other guesses? June 20th. I think uh, official summer begins on June 20th. Yeah. But, but for some of us, like my summer began a, a few weeks ago when school ended. Now, last couple of weeks, the mercury's really shot up, right? I think last week we were in the hundreds. I'd prefer 75 all year round, but for some reason the weather just doesn't want to listen to me. Okay. So Christy and Wesley and I, um, the other day when we were in the car, were talking about we're, we were talking about um, the seasons in North Dakota. And you know the old joke is we have two seasons, right? What are the two seasons? What was that? Winter and road construction, right? So that's, that's a joke. Any you know, Midwestern town, you walk into a diner, that's a joke you're going to hear, right? But if you've spent any time in other parts of the country, like back east, you know there's four seasons, right? They last a little bit longer than they do here. So growing up in Michigan, um, 
you know, we had kind of an extended fall. We didn't really hit winter. I mean, there were some years where uh, Christmas would come around and might snow just a few days before. Um, November sometimes was nice and warm in the 60s and 70s. Here, most years, it seems like we get uh, snow by when, usually? Halloween, right? So it's a little bit more abbreviated here. Um, the same with spring, the thaw begins sometime, usually from what I remember growing up, it began sometime in March. Here, sometimes we're getting snow in April, May, right? <laughs> Um, but but, but uh, back east where I grew up, it's like May, June before it really gets warm and hot. Um, but here, you know, as soon as it hits like 35 degrees in March, what do you normally see people doing? They, they roll their windows down, right? I do. When we go from like negative 40 to 35, I start rolling my windows down, I crack the windows. I know a lot of my middle schoolers at school, they start wearing shorts, which is crazy, but you know, God bless them. Um, but during weeks like this, last couple of weeks, especially after the year that we've had, the nice weather, people are, are where? They're out, you know, campgrounds by the beach, enjoying life, maybe um, digging their feet into sand on the, on the waterfront, taking walks along the river. So that's where Mark begins, is by the Sea of Galilee. In the sand, Jesus on a boat, not a pontoon, nice little fishing boat, and, Mark chapter 4, he begins teaching by the beach on the waterfront. And in the beginning of the chapter, Mark tells us a very large crowd had gathered around him. It says in verse 1 again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat, sat in it out on the lake while the people were along uh, the shore at the water's edge. Have you ever been to, um, you know, like one of those gatherings where people might have a bunch of pontoons out on the water and Maybe there's a lot of music playing or fireworks going off. I'd like to think that maybe this was a relaxed scene, but we're going to look at a, a painting that looks a little bit more busy than maybe what we're normally used to. There's a lot going on there. So we're going to visualize this scene in, in Mark chapter 4. This painting is called The Seaport with the Sermon of Christ or The Harbor Scene with Christ Preaching by this Flemish painter, Jan Bruegel the Elder. It was completed in 1598. So this one's like 420 some years old. So just kind of look at it for a moment. If you've ever been to a museum, you just walk around, kind of enjoy the art. Take, take a look and think about what you're seeing. Make some observations. If you've ever taken a um, art appreciation class, you know, sometimes they'll ask you to analyze and make notes what, what kind of colors or hues, what kind of expressions are on the face, what's the context. Does anyone see where Jesus is teaching? Any guesses as to which boat he's on? There's a lot of them. So let's zoom in a little bit. Let's see a little bit better. You see Jesus now, right? In the center. Okay, we'll go one more. Ah, there he is. You know, um, it's interesting because you, you look throughout art history, oftentimes, you know, it's not a realist painting where they're trying to uh, make the scene look like it's actually set in Israel. It, it looks, you know, Flemish, Dutch, Northern European to me. Um, and it's interesting also because um, in all the synoptic gospels um, record the story. They record him teaching on a boat just this one single time. So in the visual commentary on scripture, which features this painting, it's a website where um, different scholars have gotten together and they've taken passages from the Bible and they look for Christian art, to kind of um, analyze and make connections. Um, the scholar Michael Banner, who is a fellow at Trinity College in Cambridge, describes the painting like this. Mark and Matthew specify that what he teaches on, on the occasion is the parable of the sower, and in Luke it's told in chapters, um, chapter 8, 14 through 18. But the visual representation cannot very well indicate the content of Christ's teaching. Nonetheless, the scene depicted by Jan Bruegel the Elder is effective in echoing the story of the parable. Banner writes, We look down towards the harbor from a high vantage point yielding a vast panoramic perspective that reaches 
to far distant mountains on the horizon. The colors of the picture work to suggest depth receding from strongly defined forms and dark browns and greens in the foreground through to fainter contours executed in lighter greens and blue. Characteristically, Bruegel produces not so much a landscape as a dramatic and mysterious worldscape. This is a monumental vista, taking in entire regions in a way no human eye can. These worldscapes allow, however, not only a panorama of the natural terrain, but also of the human activity it contains. It's very busy, isn't it? Not everyone is focused on Christ preaching in the picture. There's a market, there's people fishing, people doing business. Over there, maybe some picnics going on. Bruegel's chosen viewpoint enables him to show both Christ preaching from a boat and the burden of that teaching. On the one hand, we can make out Christ just visible on the boat in the center there. If you look at the whole painting, it's, it's hard to see him unless you zoom in. And he's addressing a considerable crowd. And the cares of this world prevent the seed from coming to harvest. So Bruegel portrayed fish markets like the one in this panel on several occasions. Here the artist sets Christ preaching by the coast adjacent to the absorbing bustle of just such a market. An eager crowd hears the word to be sure, but from a wider perspective, Christ is, is very small and he's difficult to pick out and his words must compete with all that busyness. And even here, not everybody is listening. So at the beginning, um, I told you the parable was very straightforward. <clears throat> it doesn't really take very long to understand, but I think that's the point. If you turn your attention to Jesus and the words in this passage, just like I ask you to look at the painting and ask some questions and record some observations, would you be willing to do that now with your own life in mind and ask yourself this question? When you heard the gospel of Jesus for the very first time, how did you receive that? Were you, were you excited? Did, did you hang on to the words? Were you eager? Were you trying to get a glimpse of the glory of God? Or where were you? How about this question? What kind of plants have grown up in the garden of, of your heart since first hearing the gospel? What kinds of fruits have you seen in your life? the the pain of life and when we um, experience that pain wondering if if God sees um, if he understands has the pain and suffering of this life hurt you so badly that you question whether God is good is he a good God well the great thing about being a believer is if you look at the lives of saints through the ages this is a question all of them have asked right something we always struggle with. It's a fundamental question. Consider the painting again in the busyness of the crowded beach. There's so much going on, it, be kind of, it can be kind of dizzying to find a place to focus your eyes. If you go out again, where should I look? What should I look to? Have the cares, concerns, even the pleasures of the world choked out the message you've received that you have to be born again to enter the kingdom of God? There's this uh, French convert and um, philosopher named Simone Weil 
who once wrote that attention, so our attention taken to its highest degree is the same thing as prayer. It presupposes faith and love. Absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. If we turn our mind towards the good, it's impossible that little by little the whole soul will not be attracted thereto in spite of itself. So when you see the goodness of Jesus, we can't help ourselves but be drawn to him. So in the parable of the sower, isn't Jesus pointing out to us that we need to take care that our attention be given to him? That our careful attention should be for cultivating a life where the seed of healing salvation is sown in good soil? So one interesting thing when reading this and when considering um, the view This on a wall with PVC pipe and water, and it was cool. But we took him down to BSC um, back in April. Did you see a professor demonstrate some precision ag software? Has anyone seen precision ag software before in here? Maybe not. Okay, if you have, it's, it's really neat. Uh, we had this um, look like a Google map, right? This is a GPS system. You can actually zero on different plots of land all around the state, and you can see um, information about the salinity, what kind of crop yields there are there. You can see um, moisture levels uh, so that you can make recommendations for what you should plant, right? Extremely interesting, okay? Um, not only that, we also saw from one professor, depending on how much salt one finds in the soil, it should determine um, what you should plant, right? So there's some cr crops that are really resistant to um, high salinity levels. There's others that actually um, thrive there, like barley. Things like barley grow pretty well in, in salty soil. So depending on you know, the farmer and what kind of land they have, they can get recommendations for what they should do. A lot of work goes into it, a lot of research, a lot of um, consulting. And if you grew up on a farm to get ready for planting season, I'm guessing that some of you as kids probably had to remove rocks from the field. Anyone ever have to remove rocks? Yeah. It's a lot of work. Rocks impede the growth of the crop as well as the equipment that plants and harvests the crop. You've got to move them out of the way. That's why if you're driving out in rural North Dakota, you drive by a farm, sometimes on the edges of the farm you'll see big rock piles, right? Okay. A lot of hard work had to go into moving those rock piles. You know, in the United States and around the world, people devote their entire lives to the science of growing things. We spend billions, trillions of dollars on learning how to best 
harvest our crops, how to best plant them, um, how to genetically modify things like soybeans and corn and wheat and barley and sunflowers so they can get higher yields. So if all of this work goes into something like planting, what then is Jesus saying the equivalent might be in preparing ourselves and other people for the spiritual harvest he's alluding to in Mark 4? I think there's work. I think there's work to be done. The next image that we're going to look at is by Edward Hopper. Most of you know him for his one scene. I think it's called Nightbirds or something like that. It's a diner scene. It's very quiet and muted. This one's similar to that. It's titled The Automat. It was completed in uh, 1927. So an automat is basically like an um, old-fashioned convenience store. You go in, get coffee, coffee cake. Um, here, uh, Banner writes again, in many of Edward Hopper's paintings, it's as if a certain curtain um, has gone up at the opening of a play. The scene is heavy with a tense silence, which in a play would be explained and perhaps resolved, but in a painting like this one, it's destined to remain a mystery, like a parable inviting interpretation. So the setting is an automat. Historically, the word named a uh, vending machine, or here it's a restaurant or cafe in which food was obtained from such machines. So chains of automats like these flourished um, in the first half of the 20th century, 20th century. They were popular in big cities like New York, where Hopper worked. And in this picture, a well-dressed and attractive young woman sits alone at a table in such an establishment, dressed against the cold with fur-trimmed coat and gloves. A glove remains on her hand, and she um, looks like if she feels chilled even indoors. She has eaten whatever modest item of food was on the small plate before her and finishes her drink, which, with a radiator by the door, provides some comfort from the cold. One interesting thing is, is the reflection behind her, the lack of reflection in the, in the window. Reflections of the somewhat harsh restaurant lights are prominent above her head. Below them, she is lost in her own inward reflections. Her unhappy demeanor suggests that her reflections take her nowhere very far, just as those above her lead only to the utter darkness outside, which ominously reveals no hint of light or life beyond her confines. Mysteriously, while she reflects, she is not in herself reflected. The pane of glass which registers the light does not register her. It is as if she is, to all intents and purposes, invisible. There's nothing out there. A colorful bowl sits um, in the cafe window behind her. Symbolic fruit may suggest temptation, or in the rather desolate automat where one must serve oneself and may point out to temptation's utter absence. In Christ's parable, fruit is what is born of the seed. In Mark 4, which falls into good soil. And since the seed is the word, where there is no fruit, the word itself has failed, and there is presumably only silence. So in Hopper's picture, silence is overwhelmingly present. And one thing, if you were listening to Tony last week, is sometimes there's a silence of God that we experience, right? As saints, sometimes we pray we don't hear God. Sometimes it feels like maybe he's not there. But that wrestling is, is different than what's going on in this picture. So for all faithful Christians, one aspect of God's sovereignty we're always going to wrestle with is, is sometimes that perceived silence when we ask for the healing of a loved one, when we ask for a job that we really want and we don't get. But you know, if you think about the universe as a whole, there's so many moving parts, so many things going on. I think when you think about what, G, or what God is um, telling Job and Job, which Tony was talking about last week, there's so many things going on. How, how can we even begin to comprehend the mind of God and why he allows certain things to happen and intervenes at other times? The silence of God that we experience is not the same silence which you find this woman experiencing here because we eventually get an answer in Jesus. The silence is broken at the cross, right? The silence is broken at the resurrection. The silence is broken when the Holy Spirit descends on the apostles. It's a different silence than what the saints experience in Revelation chapter 8, 1, where it says, you know, heaven was silent for half an hour. The silence from the absence of fruit, though, the, si the absence of the plant being given life in the soil of our heart is more of what we see here. This silence is the evidence of a permanent distance, the kind that's found 
in Matthew 13 where Jesus says there's going to be people on the outside of the kingdom, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's an eternal silence. I feel like the silence in this picture is a silence that's never broken. Just like a field that's never going to grow anything. It's only going to bake under the sun. Nothing to show for it. Last picture for today. Vincent Van Gogh. You guys like Van Gogh, right? Everybody likes Van Gogh. This one is called The Sower. grow anything on them. That's the kind of tree right here. Some of those branches are, are dead. But sometimes from the wounds of those branches, fresh blossoms spring, holding up over the, so the sower's lowered head a sign of promise and hope and joy even as the light of the setting sun fades.
tending to our soil. That's just one example. You know, most of us, like Jim was talking about resting earlier, most of us are, you know, give our um, phone numbers to our bosses and managers. We have our email, work email downloaded to our phones. So we're always connected, never really taking a break, always burdened. And our relationships, I feel like, are healthy.
last thing, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruits of the Spirit. Take a piece of paper, write down the fruits of the Spirit on one side.